Hey guys, so I thought I might try a new style of video on this channel. As some of you may have possibly detected, those of you that have been subscribed to this channel for some length of time, I'm looking to sort of do more with this channel, but I've almost hit a Mexican standoff with myself. And it's like, there are so many, you know, avenues I could take this channel, there's so much I want to do with it. And I'm almost sort of paralyzed by the just the amount of possibilities. So I'm going to start trying ideas and this is one of them. So if you've clicked on this video, which you have, uh, I assume, um, thanks for giving this idea a shot. So uh, this is like a comment commentary style of video that I'm going to do. Uh, I don't know how often I'm going to do it. It might turn out that I'm going to do them once every uh, sort of X number of videos goes up, or, or, or maybe it might be once a week, once a month, whatever. Um, and it's just going to be where I, I sort of read out some of your comments and sort of discuss, do a bit of follow-up, talk about maybe cor correct some errors that I've made in previous videos, talk a little bit about the channel, give you any sort of updated information, some like small news that wouldn't make it into a video in and of itself. Um, so uh, if you're like watching this on a desktop or something, just like uh, switch to another tab, start to start surfing around. There's not going to be too much of a visual display on this video. Okay, so the first video is the one where I talk about Shred, which is a command line app pick that I decided that I was going to show on the channel, which is, yeah, so it's a command line tool that basically let you um, take a hard drive um, and then just completely shred it, wipe it, so that it would be safe to sell secondhand or, or hand out, so that there's no like residual information left on it. Uh, so a comment from uh, Noah, and there's going to be a lot of mispronunciations on on this series, so I apologise profusely in advance. Uh, but Noah Desua, um says uh, warns to do not use this on an SSD or any flash device. It will not work and will be bad for your drive. So um, I double checked this, and um, w w because of the way uh, SSDs work, and because they work obviously different to like spinny disk optical drives, um, also like you know the regular old SATA drives. Um, Using Shred normally, like the, how I demonstrated in the video, it was specifically for your standard like um, uh, hard drives. If you would you use it on an SSD, it's still worth doing according to what, what judging from what I've read and what and the, and the research I've done. But you only ever need to do one iteration of it. So it would be Shred dash dash iterations equals one. Um, and then slash device slash and then the hard, the hard drive you wanted to wipe the device you wanted to wipe. Um, but I must say that there is a like opinion is very much divided on that particular issue as to uh, not only how like secure it is, whether or not it's overkill, uh, but also um, how much it damages the SSDs. SSDs are like getting phenom you know sort of better and better as time goes on now, uh, to the point where they seem to have uh, superseded optical drives, uh, uh, you know SATA drives in uh, you know in absolute. But um, but I'm not 100% certain on that. Uh, Zunius Zoo asks, does this work on a partition slash drive level only, or can you specify folders to wipe? Um, you can use it on specific folders, but only, it's only it only really works under certain file systems. Um, check the help file, check the man pages, so just like go to the command line and type man space shred, and you'll get the uh you, you know you'll get what it can do and what it can't do but with journal in file systems which are like your standard ext3 and ext4 file systems uh which which my computers are on um it doesn't apparently work very well or it's of limited usefulness is what what it says in the man pages so uh take that for what you will um they say that the only 100% way to make sure the data is completely removed from a drive uh, is to make sure that it's like physically destroyed because apparently uh, according to a few blogs that I've I've read up on uh, what can happen is that there can be like data stored that data becomes bad sectors those bad sectors then get cordoned off so that that, that, that sort of information is almost always preserved there as bad sectors rather than being properly wiped and in theory is recoverable. I don't know how far into sort of the, the academic discussion we're getting here. Um, so I'll uh, I'll move on now. 
Okay, so the next video is the one where I talk about the Epiphany browser, which um, I came back to because I um, sort of tried out the Epiphany browser years ago before I was making YouTube videos, and I thought that it was a pretty good stand-in as a Firefox substitute, but Firefox was just kind of better, so I kind of, you know, disregarded this. Um... But I came back to it now that it's built into GTK3, and, and of course Firefox is quite famously still on GTK2 now. So uh, it is interesting, um, and also of course the, the web browser is specifically designed for Linux, whereas Mozilla Firefox is, is it really is designed as a cross-platform browser, but it does focus on Windows more than it does focus on Linux. And of course if that's where the majority of its user base is, you can't fault them too much for that. But um, this is um, a browser from the eyes of, of a Linux distribution um, or, you know, from a, with a Linux desktop in mind. Um, and it, it feels more natural. It feels like it blends into the desktop a little, you know, a little bit more and it looks a bit nicer. So um, Ultraviolet asks, can you import bookmarks into it? Uh, you can. You just export your bookmarks into the HTML file uh, as you would do with Firefox and Chrome, and you can import it. I tried it out specifically. Um, Chris Creations says they should really add extensions. The thing about GNOME or GNOME is that it's very customizable once you install a bunch of extensions. The browser doesn't have them. Um, if the browser uh, if the browser doesn't have them, um, if no, if it had extensions, then I'd probably use this over the others. Um, it doesn't have extens uh, extensions or add-ons. And the problem with a lot of these smaller browsers, the ones that are basically not Firefox or Chrome, is that you're going to have trouble getting add-on support and those add-ons, you know, being maintained. Um, so uh, when it comes to things like list... I, I, so I don't, I don't really know the best sort of course of action for when it comes to, to add-on frameworks. As I understand it, there is a standardization in process. Uh, I believe that Firefox are, make, are eventually going to make it so that you can run uh, Chrome add-ons on, on the Firefox browser. And th I suppose, you know, the, in theory, that framework could be carried across to other, uh, to, to Epiphany, the Epiphany browser. So, but the, the thing is, GNOME is customizable, but it's kind of not designed to be customizable, if you know what I mean. Like, if you just had a vanilla GNOME desktop, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to change the themes, um, and you wouldn't be able to change a lot of the, lo you know, you wouldn't be able to change the orientation of any of the panels or anything like that. And it's only when you install the GNOME tweak tool that you sort of add the advanced level features there, which seem to to me to seem the more sort of hack hackish way of doing it. Um, but then again, of course, the GNOME desk, you, you know, I, I have often said that there are specific advantages for not having customizability on flagship distributions because it can intimidate new users. Uh, your average new user isn't going to know the difference between a Mate and a Cinnamon desktop. They're just going to want the, something, anything that's easy to use and that can get up and go. And I think that the, the GNOME desktop does a pretty damn good job of that in, in its vanilla form, to be honest. Uh, it's a little resource heavy, which is why I don't use it, but I think that it has some some pretty good uh, upsides to it. So, so the the Epiphany web browser is the browser that that sort of uh, naturally fits into the GNOME environment. Um, and since the GNOME environment, it, like it doesn't have extensions, the, the the GNOME extensions, I think, are, like they're part. It's it's you know you would need to install the the GNOME tweak tool first. So, it. Um, So, so it strikes me that if you, if customizability is what you want out of a desktop environment, then there might be better ones to go for, uh, like Mate or XFCE or even KDE. Uh, but that being said, I'm sh like I'm sure many of you will disagree with me. I'm sure many of you will 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 um, you know, and and you'll probably be right if we're completely honest. Um, but yeah, uh, onto onto extensions. Um, I think the thing about Epiphany is it seems to be going for minimalism. It also seems to be going for, like, there's also this argument, and the, the, the Tor browser uses this argument, that the more, in, ex, in, the more extensions that you install, the less secure your browser becomes, uh, which is why I particularly like on the Mozilla um, add-on store, they tell you the license, and they um, tend to make it easier to link to the source code on the Mozilla browser extensions, not so much on the Chrome, obviously. Um, 
but um but yeah, like the the Tor browser says, don't install additional uh, add-ons because unless you've like reviewed the source code or whatever, there's a there's a possibility that there could be you know there could be hidden key loggers in there, there could be hidden Bitcoin miners in there, there could be all kinds of things hidden um, sort of uh, you know you could be used as a node for something uh, or um, something you know something to do with BitTorrenting, I'd imagine. Um, yeah, so so the so so to to basically lock off the add-on the extension kind of framework especially if you're a, a browser with a limited development sort of department with a limited number of people working on it uh it does strike me as actually being the safer option to just not have extensions and not have an extension framework and just have that ensured stability i would like them to have had a few more privacy features maybe the ability to manipulate javascript a little bit more um I, I, I could make that criticism against all browsers, though. Uh, and they do let you... Like, perhaps maybe an option to let you delete your cookies on exit or something to... Or, or, or possibly on the close of the tab. But um, there you go. Uh, I, I... From what... I'm not I'm not a programmer by any stretch of the imagination. But the... the it, it does seem that um, the, the add-on framework seemed to be particularly difficult. Uh, seem to you know they difficult. They seem to require like a lot more work, and they, you know a lot more people to work on them. Um, uh, David Ack says, "I need something like Ghostry uBlock Privacy Badger. Uh, if they would add this next to ad blocking, it would become my default browser." Um, you'll try it on the new Elementary OS beta. I like that Elementary OS has decided to adapt it or no, adopt it as their uh, primary browser. I think that it would work very well in the in, in the framework of their um, distribution. Uh, but you are right. Just like uBlock, for example, you know, uh, or, or 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 the ability to add lists. Filter lists would be a great one as well, because then you could just get some filter lists or use the ones that uBlock use, um, and then. Um, use them so like the ability to implement block lists would would be good for the most part um a, like a built-in privacy badger would be amazing um but again you're sort of you the 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 issue the issue is on the uh, for, for the most part is on the end of the um developers for the for the add-ons and if you're going to develop an add-on for for as as wide a use as possible you're probably not going to get that many people using it if you develop it for a small browser over a over a Firefox or a Chrome, unfortunately, it's uh, the you know it's a problem we've had time immemorial. Um, oh yes, and of course, uh, Peter Botha uh, says, um, for what it's worth, Firefox Developer Edition also allows processes per tabs, and it performs very well. That is true. Although when I have tried it and. And you know the 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 beta version of it is obviously going to going to not be as polished and and, and smoothed out. Uh, it didn't perform as well as I'd like, but it did perform better than it could have. I, I guess is what I, what I'm trying to say there. Uh, I think it uh, sometimes it still sort of slowed the browser down a little bit more, but you 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 could by contrast then just switch into another tab a little bit more easier since the processes were were separate. Um, what else have we got here? Okay, uh, now Spencer Brown asks, uh, will I be doing Reconk next? It's pretty much the KDE equivalent to Epiphany. For a long time, it was really crusty, but over the last couple of months, it's gotten a lot more stable. I've even started using it as my main browser. That's quite interesting. I was certainly thinking of doing Conqueror. Um, I'm just trying to think about doing it in the right forum because I, of course, my daily driver is Manjaro XFCE edition, and that probably isn't going to showcase qt apps in the in the best way maybe if i um, had a virtual machine with a kde desktop in it i could do that um i would certainly have a look at the the feature set uh because conqueror uh i'm sorry conqueror and reconk uh, i would consider doing both um i the 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 feature set of Conqueror is pretty good, actually. It's a lot more than Epiphany. Um, so I imagine Reconk is like the lightweight version of Conqueror, then. Um, Davon Jones asks, uh, can I take a look at Remix OS? Um, I think I will be looking ab on it, uh, about it. It, it, it is... Uh, sorry. It is on the list, but it's not top of the list. Um, and then Paper 9 Ol, uh says that Epiphany is very buggy. Um... Yes, I've actually had 
even though the build that I reviewed for the video did not crash on me and it seems to have gotten a lot stabler lately, I certainly feel that the Epiphany browser in, uh, of, of years ago is certainly not as stable as, as, as Chrome, for example. But I think that now uh, the Epiphany browser, I don't think it crashed on me at all. So um, so I, I, it seems like the stability is improving. Okay, so the next video I talk about browsing the web without JavaScript. Um, so using add-ons like NoScript uh, or uh, Umatrix to just turn off JavaScript by default and then maintaining a whitelist. So, um, yeah, a lot of very interesting, very insightful comments on this one. Uh, Ultraviolet said, surely just disabling the third-party cookies is the default way forward. Um, it seems that that works uh, the best. That seems to be the, the best balance between usability and, um, and security. Uh, especially, it, it 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 stops the worst culprits definitely, uh, the scorecard research and all those kind of people. Uh, but if you are on Firefox or Chromium or Chrome, um, I you know I would still advise at least using a privacy badger and maybe even in addition something like um, uh, like disconnect or um, or possibly some of the lists from uBlock which can um, stop. Uh, malicious code from uh, from being run on websites. Um, I at the moment am still currently just allowing first party Java and first party cookies, uh, and then I've got yeah U Matrix as a whitelist. No, just even first party Java because you only ever really need cookies on websites that you log into, of which um, you know so so you can white. It's easy enough to whitelist those as you go. You just whitelist as you make an account for a site. Um, and then with uh, with JavaScript, it's just first-party JavaScript. And for the most part, that seems to be all right. There's one or two websites that, that don't look great. Um, if I want to play a video on something, I usually have to either play the video through YouTube or uh, whitelist as well. It's not too much of a hassle uh, once it becomes part of a part of your routine. It's a bit like driving a stick shift in the sense that you are shifting gears multiple times during a journey quite a lot, but you do it so often that it becomes part of the the whole you know driving uh, routine. Um, someone who I can't pronounce says that they tried browsing with no script and it broke so many sites that they couldn't bother. Yeah, I can guess I can kind of um, imagine that now. I mean, that's why I feel that I've got to browse with first-party JavaScript turned on. I think it's a real shame in a way because a lot of the time it's not needed. The JavaScript just isn't needed. And it's about using, you know, what it's not having unnecessary bells and whistles. And it's not, you know, like a simple HTML page will do in the vast majority of cases rather than, than anything, you know, unnecessarily fancy with... Uh, uh, with JavaScript, CSS is different because CSS is, is is convenient and it allows for a much more consistent layout of websites and it actually reduces the workload by a lot and it's it there's no effect on security or anything like that. But um, for the most part, but um, with JavaScript, um, it's such a powerful language that um, that you can you know you, you can do it, it can you know a lot can be done with it and. Um, and sometimes it's just nice to put safety locks on it, I guess. Um, I turn off Java. I can't actually, to be honest, I can't even remember the last time I used Java. Um, oh, Hamek uh, Bajusha. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, MPV for the win. Uh, MPV, for those of you that don't know, is a... Uh, it's a new media player that's doing the rounds. It's really good. Um... It's a very minimalist one, very lightweight, um, but um, it works a treat. MPV. Uh, it's available in the Manjaro repositories. I think it's available in Ubuntu 16.04. So, yeah, get that. That's really good. Um, it doesn't even use, like, a GTK or, or Qt toolkit. It just runs in a single... Um, well, you know, install it and and, uh, and run it and see for yourself or just look it up on YouTube. It's great. It's definitely worth a look. Uh, someone else uses Chromium with script block, uh, which kind of makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, and also a shout out to the Great Suspender, which is a great uh, Firefox add-on. I don't know if there's a Chrome version. 
Um, basically, it um, earmarks your tabs but doesn't load them. So uh, it saves up a bit of memory so that it lets you um, keep... Like it, it looks like the tab is open, but the website has, has since been cleared, and then you click on that tab again. And, and that happens like once you've uh, not visited that tab for X amount of time. You can set the amount of time. Uh, it's really good if you want to save some memory. Okay, so like judging from like most of the comments on the video, and there are quite a lot uh, to go through. Most of you have like you have pretty diverse setups, so there's not you know, but many of you do um, block JavaScript by default with an add-on like NoScript, um, and then just sort of you know use that. Um, and and the thing I like about NoScript. Uh, is that it allows you to put like just that one button up in your interface for for Firefox where you just where it just says temporary temporarily allow all on this page and it's one button and it uh, temporarily adds whatever site you're, you're on to the whitelist and then re automatically refreshes it and that actually makes it really quite convenient to have no script on there. Um, many of you just stick with the the privacy badger disconnect ghostry. Um, I personally don't advocate using ghostry because. Uh, first of all, it's not open source, uh, and when it comes to security, you can really only really 100% trust open source, and there are enough open source options there for you to be safe. There is an open source object um, option for security, uh, for security uh, every single time, uh, because people that know a lot, you know, a damn sight lot more about it than I do, um, swear by open source. Um, when it comes to things like security, uh, especially when you're talking about home security and things where you don't have like professional teams of people constantly auditing stuff. Um, oh, Squeaky Pancakes mentions Light, which is a browser that I've only seen once. It was, uh, it's in the, uh, BSPWM build of Manjaro, um, which is a surprisingly good build for something as obscure as it is. Um, because I've never heard of the BSP window manager, um, and I'm actually currently looking through it for a review now, for a review video for this channel, and, um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's gonna be an interesting review video, you guys want to check that one out, um, or even just check out the window manager as well, but, um, yeah, it comes with light by default, which is, um, basically a version of Firefox that's lighter. Um, and it looks really good, but I don't see it very often, and um, and I don't know if it's because it's new. Um, it looks very, very Firefoxy to the point where it almost looks like it could be made by Mozilla. I don't know if it is, um, but it does look like a good browser. Uh, Cupzilla, Cubzilla, rather, also looks like quite a good browser. Um, Matthew Simplay um, turns off JavaScript with a whitelist just for the performance benefit. There is, yes, the performance benefit is pretty good, actually. Like, um, you know, there are so much wasted JavaScript on websites that um, that you can make a decent performance boost. It would, I would love that option on tablets. That would be an amazing option to have on tablets to turn off JavaScript because uh, that would be where I think you make the most saving. You'd probably save a fair amount on battery as well. Um, but yeah, so most of you do seem to have a pretty diverse one, but you seem to be conscious of it. Now, I'm, I've got to say that this is a bit more, there's a bit of, um, I don't know, selection bias, the right one, or volunteer bias, where the kinds of people that are going to be leaving a comment discussing this are, are automatically by definition going to be engaged with the subject and aware of the situation. So, um, but if I ask the man on the street, you know, do you like most people don't even use any browser extensions at all? I think I re remember reading somewhere. So um, you know, if you're if you're listening to this and you're watching that video, um, the chances are you're probably more in the know than most people. Um, but you know, most of you are. Uh, so the next video is my elementary OS review, and I got to say. Um, the review that I gave before Elementary uh, wasn't really that great. It wasn't really that shining. But I reviewed it, the latest one that came up, um, which was Elementary 0 0.4 Loki Beta. So I had a look at the beta. Got to admit, very stable for a beta. Very stable for a beta. Uh, it, looks, it looks really nice. It looks really, really consistent design. Uh, it it looks great. It looks like 
and it's not customizable. So it looks like you, you know, it would be a very good candidate if someone had a laptop and they came to me and said, Chris, put Linux on this. I don't want anything too fancy. I just want to do the basics. Like I got to say, elementary mint would be my usual go to. And judging from what I've seen from the mint betas as well, it, the, the Mate version in particular, but, but it, it generally looks like it's going to be pretty good. You know, mint is as mint does. Mint is XP for the, for the current day. Um, however, elementary OS seems to be like, Linux is just really, really easy to use. It's like it doesn't even try and it, it's kind of got a slightly Mac esque outline, um, but really that's it, the 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 immediate you know sort of superficial is is really where it ends. Um, and I gotta say it it seemed consistent. It seemed stable. It seemed like there was a lot of care and attention gone into it. Um, and 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 it I think to me. It gives a really good full, a, a really good first impression uh, for new newcomers to Linux, and that's what I was looking for in this distribution, and that's what I found. So comments. Uh, there is an elementary tweak um, thing that you can install. Um, it's an unofficial app, uh, but it integrates quite well to the system. So even if you are a bit more of a power user, a bit more um, experience with Linux, and you want a little bit more customizability at your system, there is an option. So, um, which I'm, you know, I, 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 I expect there would have been. Um, Xanaris uh, Falador, and I apologize if I've mispronounced your name, says that the elementary devs have done an outstanding job with this distribution, bravo. True words you have. Um, so a lot of you are generally speaking pretty well, um, pretty highly of uh, of elementary OS. There's not really much you can really diss about it, um, other than uh, maybe the elementary desktop might be might require a little bit more memory um, and a little bit more graphical power than you really want out of an older machine. So I wouldn't necessarily put it on an older machine. I'd go with something like Lubuntu, the LXDE version of Ubuntu. That works really well on the lighter machines, but but for this as a, as something that you'd really want to to show off, this is pretty good. Uh, I David P asks, do I have any plans to look at Solus OS? Um, it is on the list. It's one that is on the list, um, and it will be coming up soon. But um, there are a couple that are before it. Um, and when I say it's on, like the it's really like how I do videos is kind of interesting in a way that um, like when I say it's on the list, it means that I'm going to try and make a video about it. But in a lot of cases, uh, videos do actually get scrapped mid process. So, for example, it could be that I'm I I give like I might be I might consider giving an overly negative review on a piece of software or something or a distribution when I really don't want to. You know, like. Um, when it comes to open source software, since you know it is a community effort, and since a lot of open source software is developed by like volunteers and open source by the goodwill of the community, coming along and and and, and talking shit is really something that, that it's not classy to do. It's not classy to do. So I try and keep as much as my, of my reviews and stuff like that as on the on the positive side um, as possible. And if something isn't positive, I will generally scrap it rather than. Um, if it's if it if it you know if it doesn't as as, as long as it doesn't like hurt, make any situations worse, um, I generally won't um, won't won't mention it um, at all just to sort of stay out of it and also as well to to give it a chance to improve. Like if I sort of shared my opinion a negative opinion of the Epiphany browser a couple of years ago, um, th then it would would clash with 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 uh, you know now that the Epiphany browser has improved. Um, I you know that that information was that that old opinion would still be you know people are still watching videos on this channel from two years ago, so um, so I try and keep it positive. It just makes things a lot more easier. And again, I don't you know I don't want to go around sort of making enemies as well. I don't want to I don't want to discourage people from from like engaging in the community. And I want to keep this place as possible you know as positive as possible. Um, you know, there's space for like healthy criticism, of course. But um, and and I and I hope that there is some of that on this channel, but. But there's there's that, and then there's uh, there's just being a dick, I guess. Um, but uh, and so occasionally, if I feel like I'm being too harsh on a on a piece of software, um, then I'll I'll scrap a video, or for for any number of other reasons. 
Uh, sometimes it just like there's not a good way to to get a review out for it. Um, but yeah, a lot of you uh, a lot of you seem to be pretty big fans uh, of this. Um, uh, Will Seven Vin says that they're a programmer and really enjoy using it uh, after a bit of a distro hop. So fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I like I paint this as a distribution that's very newbie friendly because it does look very newbie friendly to me, and they make a lot of they they, they make a lot of correct decisions in, in 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 terms of the little things. So I don't think of it as a programmer or power user distribution, but considering that it has, uh, and there's another question down here that kind of relates to this. Someone asks, um, "I'm a programmer. Do you recommend this distribution?" So basically, Elementary OS and Linux Mint OS both have the Ubuntu repositories to draw from, uh, which means that basically it, it's it's a pretty good all-purpose distribution. So it, I'm not a programmer, but it, it does seem like if you need certain tools, you'll find those tools there if you'll find them on Ubuntu. Alexander um, says that he wants to point out a few things. Uh, the app center is brand new in Loki. So it's the very first uh, version of it. But it works damn well. Yes, it was. I was very much impressed with it. It was simple. It was straightforward. Easy to use. Nice. Um, and every single uh, default app has notifications built in. So, for example, if you type sudo apt upgrade and switch your focus window to a web browser, once the command finishes its execution, you'll get a desktop notification um, that it's done. Yeah, and that is nice. And you've got a bell icon in the top right, which you can see the notifications that you've missed. Ah, oh, that's nice. Okay. Uh, the panel at the top also matches the background image. So if you've got a dark background, the text will be white. If you've got a light background, the text will be uh, black or dark. And you will get a nice transparency so that you can so that it'll adjust to your wallpaper so that you can see the text. Uh, if there's no need for transparency, the panel becomes completely transparent. Of course, once you have a maximized app, it goes full black automatically. Uh, there are already a dozen or two dozen uh, third-party apps created specifically for elementary OS that blend into the system perfectly, like the RSS Reader, um, the To Do app, the Elementary Tweaks, um, a podcast app, Twitter client. Uh, so the elementary team developed quite a healthy ecosystem that the developers are happy with. That's pretty cool. Um, so that's basically um, some things you wanted to point out. And thank you. Uh, yes. So it's, it's it's things like that that I that have really sort of um, made have, have really warmed me to elementary OS. I the thing about it, it deserves much more exposure than it gets. It really does. Um, yeah. I'm going to move on now because basically the rest of the comments are you guys praising uh, Elementary OS, I think. Um, but it is. And I always love being surprised by a distribution. Pleasantly surprised. And to be honest, I don't I don't know what I was expecting. The My review, I think, of 0.3, it was okay. Um, I think I was still adjusting to like client-side decorations and things like that back then. Um and there was a lot of st stuff that seemed a little bit newer, perhaps. Um, so I do, yeah, I feel like maybe the 0 0.3 review, uh, in hindsight, actually, might have been... I don't think I necessarily said it was bad or anything. Um, but I certainly didn't sing its praises as, as, as high as I did in that video. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really good. Okay, so the next video, Linux Mint 18, Sarah Matei. First comment from Xanaris Falador. Uh, your explanation of why the codecs are not installed is something I never thought about, but is valid. I believe the explanation given by the Linux Mint devs for not including them was reducing the amount of work in maintaining the distro images. Um, that seemed to be the official explanation, and of course, less work for them is a good thing because uh, you don't you don't want to overburden developers. Uh, you want to keep things sustainable, and that means you know, reducing the workload as much as possible. So it makes perfect sense from that point of view. I always think, I think they should um, choose the, one of the, you know, one flagship distribution and move with it. Maybe, I think Cinnamon now is has got to be basically ready. And they can ditch Mate. 
I mean, it, it's so it's got to be confusing for newcomers that the you know the difference between a Marte and a cinnamon desktop. Um, it's certainly not you know that that that's the thing that's the thing I, I like about the elementary OS is that it does make your decisions for you and for newcomers that's what you need and for power users that's definitely what you don't need. Um, so you know obviously you're striking a balance there. Um, but yeah, so I was a tr I, I really liked Linux Mint because it was one of my the earlier distributions I used, and I really liked it because it ha it came pre-installed with Codex. Uh, it also had very early support for widescreen resolutions uh, out of the box before Ubuntu. Interestingly enough, I, I think I bought a brand new laptop and I installed Ubuntu on it, and I found to my dismay that it only had four three resolutions for some reason uh, i don't know if it was a problem with the laptop's hardware or whether or not but this was this was this was when as as wide screens were just like just coming in and um so i tried another distribution because the solutions that i looked for online seemed seemed like uh basically inv involved messing around with the xorg file which i tried a few times and and completely buggered up so i just thought you know what i'm going to try a different distribution i tried linux mint that looked really polished and nice and it did work and it came with codex out of the box which which really appealed to me because learning how to install software on linux was something that was again as a new ish user to linux at the time was it was still quite an intimidating thing so you know especially with with um back you know when when it wasn't sort of as as readily um you know resources like youtube weren't as readily available and um and when you're sort of the only person you know that's sort of making this this adventure into linux it's uh you know it's 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 all there's a lot of information and you've got to discern the stuff that's relevant from the stuff that's not and when you're not sort of familiar with how linux does things it can be it can be pretty tricky but uh but there you go it's all part of the learning isn't it uh matru zelef says uh i would go back to linux mint again if they had an official gnome desktop environment i know you can install gnome on mint but there would be complications because there isn't a specific build for it obviously yeah um So, so that's that's yeah. I'm surprised they've got um like XFCE builds and things like that. To be honest, the 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 Ubuntu LTS of GNOME would probably be, you know, ninety nine percent the same. Um, there's a few Mint tools, but in all honesty, the Mint tools aren't particularly groundbreaking. You know, the generally the, all the stuff you need is available on pretty much all the distributions you need. Um, at least sort of the big ones like Ubuntu and Arch and uh, and Mint. Uh, Caillou731 says, I love Mate. Yes, Mate is, again, one of my favourite uh, desktop environments, but I, I do feel at this stage, we, there's like so many. I don't know if like the GNOME shell uh, framework or whatever has made it just like so much easier to build new desktop environments. Um, or, uh, I don't, you know, like, because I remember back in the day, there used to be like, there used to be GNOME and KDE for all your like big Best, you know, distributions, and then you might have had XFCE for like something a bit more lightweight, I guess, and possibly like um like a window manager below that, and then LXDE came along, and uh, and there you go. But yeah, uh, I do love Mate. Mate is is pretty good. It's nice. It's straightforward. It's it's what GNOME two would be like, you know, if it was still around today. Um. So that's about it. I'm going to move on to the next video now. There are a few other de sort of decent comments on that one, but I want to kind of wrap up this video now. Um, of course, these videos are going to be quite rambly. Um, and this one is particularly disjointed today. I'm probably going to spend some time editing it. Um, but this one's going to probably be slightly disjointed because I'm using my tablet to look at the comments, which I have now decided is a great mistake. And I'll probably use a netbook or something instead. Um, I got like a cheap, I got a cheap tablet just so that I could have access to, to Android and any necessary Android apps. Um, I don't sort of like use it very much, but it's, I, you know, I, I, I like a keyboard to be honest. Okay. So we have the review for Linux Mint Cinnamon. And uh, this one seems to have had like quite a few more comments and quite a few more views, despite the fact that most of the bulk of the overall Mint review is on the other video. Um, some of you guys talk about hot corners. 
Um, I I I shouted down hot corners. I was like, hot corner, you know, like who uses hot? Cor-? Turns out quite a few of you use hot corners, and you know what? So do I. Right at the moment, I'm not on a. I don't, I don't tend to use. I, I'm not on a composited uh, desktop, and I use XFCE, so I don't have hot corners available to me right now. I could if I wanted to bring in a compositor, but I tend to want to. I tend to want to keep resource, you know, things as lightweight as possible. Um, but, um, but yeah, like if I if I run a KDE desktop or I run a GNOME desktop, the ability to put uh, just your 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 um, mouse pointer in the corner of the screen and just have all your windows laid out in a nice fashion when you can see what each window has in it is amazing. It's, it's a massive improvement to workflow. So, um, and you can do that with help corners in Cinnamon, you can do that with hot corners in KDE, and of course Gnome has it as part of its uh, default. So yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, uh, sorry to to hot corners i didn't mean to disregard you what i meant is i don't like i don't see many people use them but despite the fact that i i do kind of use them it, but it does feel like they were popular during the windows vi- might have been po- well, a popular some time ago and they sort of fell out of fashion as a fad but um like like desktop widgets although i don't know now you're going to tell me that that i like desktop widgets it's like um, okay uh, Zanaris Falador says that um, I used to be a big proponent. I used to be a cheerleader for Linux Mint, and it's disappointing that I seem to that that sort of enthusiasm seems to have waned. Um, so, okay, basically, um, I sort of replied to the comment specifically, but I kind of wanted to address this because uh, a, a lot of you, oh, a lot of subscribers came to this channel from a video where. Uh, I talk about how much better Linux Mint is than Ubuntu. So considering that that seems to be uh, somewhat of a force behind the channel at some point, I'm going to sort of talk about this in a video uh, here today now. Um, So Linux Mint is still great. It's everything that it was, um, but it hasn't moved on much. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because it means it's consistent. uh, Linux Mint is you know sort of almost like it's windows xp um for the current day and it's really good it's really polished um i did find that 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 sort of nasty error where the the borders went away from the the cinnamon desktop uh windows which i don't know if they'll bring back or whether or not you know but but then you know you just stick with the mint x theme or you find a theme that works so that's again it's it's a nitpick but again i will assess newbie friendly distributions um, against sort of power user distributions differently. Like, I'm not going to criticise Arch for something like that, but I will criticise Linux Mint Cinnamon for something like that. Um, the thing is with, with Mint, a great out-of-the-box experience as always. Um, when I u- first used Mint, Mint was a lifesaver and I loved it, and it was great. First of all, I'm no longer in Mint's key demographic, which means I'm not going to get excited about the things that I'll get excited about. Um... I there is a very possibility that I'll come back to it as a daily driver because I like it because it almost seems like um, Ubuntu in many ways is trying to pull away from Linux. It's trying to use its own uh, des- uh, des- sort of desktop layout. It's sort of kind of using its own apps, although it's going into the... It's, it's decided to adopt the GNOME App Store. Um, and, and Ubuntu seems to want to forge an identity for itself separate from, from Linux. And Linux Mint seems to re-Linuxify Ubuntu uh, with uh, a more Linuxy workflow. So, like for example, um, the App Store. It's just a little bit more straightforward and a little less graphical and fancy, and a little more, more down to business. Uh, a little more sort of the Linux mentality. So that's sort of how I feel about Linux Mint today. And it seems to be uh, like, and and you can install it on a on a machine. It's a very good one to set and forget as well. But the issue, I guess, or not, not that there is an issue, the reason I'm not as enthusiastic and outspoken and, and, and as much of a cheerleader for Mint as I used to be is because Mint isn't the only distribution to which those comments now apply. There was a time when they when, when, when I could point out Linux Mint is a distribution on its own. It, it had, you know, it filled a niche and it filled that niche very well. But the thing is, if you measure up something like Ubuntu Mint against Elementary, there's little in it. Um, and then, of course... Um, 
there are other just like they've you know with things like Manjaro and Antergos they've made Arch Linux really user friendly as well now so it's got to compete against that for the sort of the intermediate users the users that want to go behind Ubuntu because yeah to a point you can you can you know like Linux Mint attracted me because it was very very user friendly and had a great out of the box experience and that is great but we've got to remember that most people's first introduction to Linux is just going to be stock Ubuntu. And stock Ubuntu is not that bad when it comes to user friendliness. Um, but it almost feels like unless you're going to start, unless you've got a marketing campaign or a plan to go out and get more new, more new users than Ubuntu, um, focusing on those users uh, is, to me strikes me as being a bit more futile. So a lot of uh, Linux Mint users, uh, although probably a newbie's, might have had that distribution recommended to them by a Linux Mint user. Um, but also Linux Mint user base might be um, perhaps slightly more advanced than your uh, the new users that are switching to Ubuntu, but rather prefer the more Linuxy kind of community aspects to it and sort of want to engage with their um, Linux distribution a little more than, than you expected to from Ubuntu. Um, those are just thoughts, um, but I remember using Linux Mint as a power user as well, and it is quite good in that department. Um, I do, l I love that the App Store has comments and rate a rate a really good rate or a, a, a decent rating system. Uh, it'd be nice if they perhaps maybe um, made it a bit easier to 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 for, for for casual users to rate apps and things like that. Um, it seems like people that are only particularly enthusiastic enthusiastic about certain apps are likely to leave comments maybe not um maybe i'm being a bit overly cynical there but um but you know anything that builds and expands that kind of comment system is is definitely a good thing so i think that's about it um i've i have left out a number of comments but i've got i've got to edit this video there are actually like really long pauses where i wait for stuff to load on this tablet which obviously i can't leave in there and it's really late now which kind of means i'm probably gonna have to edit this tomorrow and when you edit a video after when you haven't just recorded it um you don't remember you know, like i can remember places to look for 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 what i want to cut out and i've got an idea about how i want the the sort of the video slash this audio uh, blog to to come out but when it's tomorrow and you you kind of you, you've not thought about it anymore so anyway this is yeah this is the new thing i'm doing it's a bit more rambly i talk about stuff Mostly, you know, it's going to be comments, uh, a little bit about this channel, maybe the direction of the channel, what I want out of this channel. Maybe I'll make some corrections. I'll talk about maybe, you know, what I'm doing in terms of on, on other projects. Um, for those of you that don't know, I run uh, a YouTube channel where I talk about flags, youtube.com forward slash fun with flags. That's uh, worth a look. It's a newer project. Uh, but it's already got a few hundred subscribers, so I'm quite happy with that. Um, and then, of course, there's a Reddit for this channel, which is r slash... Chris Ware Digital, um, and that's where we, you know, I put some app pi app pics there. I put stuff up on the subreddit that perhaps isn't enough to make it into its own video, or like if I see someone else's video that I think is really good and worth a look. Uh, what I will probably try and do is include stuff like that in um, in in this, where I'll talk about something that I've found that's you know that, that that's a bit more casual and bundle stuff in a bit more together. Uh, let me know how you think about this format. Let me know if if you if you want it tightened up or if there you know if, if there's anything you want me to specifically include. If there are any questions you want me to answer, feel free to leave them in the comment section of this video as well, because I'll also in the next video of this I will be uh, discussing comments from this video as well. They could be long. Um, to be honest, I covered like half a dozen or so videos today. I probably won't. I'll probably be doing a video like this like maybe once a week, uh, ideally. Um, so that'd be covering like two or three videos, perhaps, or maybe once a fortnight and two or three videos. Who knows? I'm going to try and nail down a schedule in the next few months and stick to it. But I've got to kind of work that out in practice rather than, you know, and work out what days are kind of easier to fit it in with the schedule. So guys, thank you very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Also, um, I'm going to plug my Twitter because um, because uh, that's that's kind of like another thing that I would do at the end of this video. And also, uh, I sh what I tend to do, I just tend to share links mostly of interesting stuff that I find uh, app picks. Again, that stuff that wouldn't generally be enough to make it into its own video. Uh, but hopefully a lot of that stuff will kind of be coming into this as well. So anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. That's about it from me today. Until next time, I've been Chris Ware and you've been awesome. Take care now.